get back into that. So if you have your, your brochure, at the end of the brochure, you'll see two things. One is marks <coughs> excuse me, of a healthy, missions-minded local church on the left-hand side. And on the back, or on the second side, we have embracing our role in the Great Commission. I really want to encourage you that this month, you take a lot of time to reflect on those two pages. The first page, the marks of a healthy, missions-minded local church, Each Sunday, we are looking at one of those marks. So the first week, we talked about the importance of gospel clarity. Last week, I know that uh, Chris preached, and so it was a little impromptu for him, but we dealt with 2 Timothy chapter 3, and specifically talking about the importance of our preaching and teaching being doctrinally focused. Well, this morning, we're going to look at a third mark of a healthy, missions-minded church, and that is the mark of intensive discipleship. Now, when I was putting this together, I just put intensive discipleship, but as I was reflecting on the passage we're going to look at this morning, I said there's a word that I'd like to add into that, intensive relational discipleship, because I want you to realize that when we talk about discipleship, when we talk about helping people grow as Christians, there is an intensely relational element to this thing of making disciples. In fact, As we get into this text, I think that there's no way you can walk away from the passage in front of us without recognizing that there is a relational dynamic to seeing someone, first of all, become a Christian, get baptized, join a church, and then begin to grow (coughs) as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let's look at the text in front of us, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're looking at verses 1 through 6 together. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness (coughs) as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandmen that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruits. Now we come to this passage of scripture, we're looking at one of the most personal scriptures we find in the New Testament. It's an extremely relational passage of scripture. The statements that are being made are the statements of someone who really loved and invested in a much younger individual. And so the Apostle Paul is really at the end of his life and at the end of his ministry, and he knows that that's the fact. He knows that he's coming to the end of the race that was set before him, and as he thinks about the last groups of people that he'll be writing to, one of those individuals that he really wanted to remind and encourage and strengthen in their ministry was this young man named Timothy. Now, my guess would be that when Timothy received this information, he was probably very similar to the age that I am today. Now, I wouldn't say that I know that for a fact. This is just thinking about how long Paul ministered, thinking about how old Timothy probably was when he met the Apostle Paul. It's likely that he would have been similar in age to what I am now. And so it would be very similar to an older man who knows he's at the end of his life, he's lived faithfully for the Lord, he's invested deeply in a young man who's in the ministry saying, I know that I'm at the end of my life and I want to encourage you, I want to strengthen you, I want to challenge you, here's what I want to tell you as you think about the end of my ministry and as I'm passing the baton on to your ministry, how you should think and how you should do the work that God's called you to. That's really the sense of the passage in front of us. And so the purpose of this text was Paul addressing and exhorting this young man, Timothy, to have a ministry that was distinguished by relational disciple-making. Again, let me say that the purpose of this section of Paul's letter was to exhort Timothy (coughs) to have a ministry that was distinguished by relational disciple-making. So let's look at this passage and see how God wants us really to have the exact same kind of ministry that the Apostle Paul challenged Timothy to have in this text. God also wants us to have 
a relational, disciple-making kind of ministry. God wants this church to be a church that has a culture that's distinguished by a relational, disciple-making ministry. So how can we do that? How can we be that kind of a church? Well, the first thing I'd like us to see this morning from the passage in front of us is that the nature of the Christian life demands, let me say it again, demands relational disciple-making in the local church. As we examine the nature of the Christian life, what, how, what kind of illustrations does God use when he describes the Christian life? What kind of illustrations should come to our mind as we think about the nature of walking as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, this passage in front of us is going to give us several, in fact, five specific statements that tell us about the nature of the Christian walk and the nature of the Christian ministry. And each of these five statements will really drive us to recognize that a relational discipleship kind of ministry is extremely important. It's an absolute necessity. Look down at three of the verses that are before us. In verse 1, he says this, Thou therefore, my son, <coughs> be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Then we move down to verse 3, and he says, Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Then we move down to verse 6, and he says, If a man also strive for the masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth, must be first partakers of the fruits. Now, we've basically read three of the six verses that we find in this passage, and in each of those verses, there are several statements that should jump out at us. Here's the first statement. The first statement is the phrase, my son. Let's say it together. What's the phrase? My son. You might say, well, what should jump out to us about that statement, my son? Well, the statement should tell us this. There is a relationship between them, like the relationship of a father and a son. There is a familial kind of relationship between Paul and Timothy. And the reason that he uses that kind of terminology, my son, is because when a person becomes a Christian, he's placed into a family. You know, when we become a Christian, there are several different things that take place. We are forgiven. We are cleansed. We are declared righteous by God. We are set apart unto God. We are regenerated. That means we have new life in Christ. But one of the things that happens to us the moment that we're saved is that we are placed into a body, the body of Christ. We become a part of a family. In fact, when we pray to God, what do we say? Our Father who's in heaven. When we talk about our relationship to one another within the church, we call each other brother in Christ, sister in Christ. In fact, when Paul's talking to Timothy and he says, this is how you're to relate to the people in the church, he says, to the older men, relate to them like they're your father. To the, young, or to the older women, relate to them as if they're your mother. To the younger men, relate to them as if they're your brother. To the younger women, relate to them as if they're your sister. We see this familial relationship and the terms of family used over and over and over again in the New Testament. What does that tell us? That tells us that the growing of the Christian life happens in the context of family. And the family is a place where there's relationship, deep relationship, connection. There is a love that should bind us one with another. He's expressing their familiar relationship in the body of Christ, and he's also expressing their mentoring relationship as one who is an older man who has experience in ministry and a younger man who has a passion for the Lord but doesn't have the experience and the depth and the wisdom yet that the Apostle Paul had. The second phrase that should really stand out is the phrase, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> in this statement, we recognize that the Christian life is a difficult life. Now, it's not difficult to become a Christian in the sense that it's simply by faith alone in the finished work of Christ. It's interesting. 
in one sense, it's very easy to become a Christian, okay? It's faith alone in Christ. In another sense, it's impossible to become a Christian, a part of the work of God. In other words, God has to open our eyes and we see that we are broken and we are helpless and we can't be saved. And so we see the difficulty on that side. But I want you to realize that when one becomes a Christian, when they enter into new life in Christ, the road that follows is not an easy road. Sometimes we give people the impression that, hey, it's not only easy to enter the kingdom, but the way is simple, and that's not true at all. There's a reason that the way that leads to destruction is broad, and the way that leads to life is narrow. The reason is because it's a whole lot easier to walk down a road where you just give in to your flesh and you just give in to the ways of the world and you just do whatever is easiest. But the Christian life is different. The way of the disciple is challenging. I become a Christian by faith alone in Christ, but as I walk as a disciple, I grow and I struggle and I'm challenged. I have to put to death those sinful passions The world's going to misunderstand me and misrepresent me. And the world is constantly going to be attacking the disposition that we have toward God. The Christian life is not an easy life. And not just the Christian life, but the life of the Christian minister. The one who is presenting the gospel is in the thick of a spiritual battle. He's facing incredible opposition And the reality is Satan doesn't like people entering into the kingdom. He doesn't like seeing people growing in the Lord. He doesn't like seeing churches established and thriving. And so the reality is that the Christian ministry is a difficult place. I'm not saying that for you to feel bad for me, okay? I love what I do. But the reality is there are challenges that I face as a pastor, There are challenges that you face as a dad or as a mom. There are challenges that you face within your working environment simply because you're a disciple of Jesus. Listen to some of the passages that use the illustration of the difficulties of the Christian experience. In Luke 14, 28, Jesus said, Which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Jesus talks about discipleship as if somebody is setting out to build something that's going to take a long time and it's going to take a huge investment of resources, financial resources, mental and physical energies. And he says, before you start, you better be committed to the task because it won't be easy. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Doesn't mean that you can't be a disciple, but it does mean that it's difficult. In Ephesians 6.12, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Sometimes I look back on my high school and college years and I ask, what was I thinking when I started wrestling? It might be shocking to know that it was my mother that encouraged me (laughs) to get into such a sport. (laughs) a sport that she knew very little about and that when she saw the first competition, she was terrified because she thought someone was going to have a broken bone of some sort. But if there's anything that I learned about the sport of wrestling, is that when you walk into the ring, it's you and them and that's it. <laughs> and let me tell you, as soon as that first lock happens, from that moment till the last whistle, it is a grueling battle. And you wouldn't think that seven minutes could feel like three hours, but it does. I remember a match one time where when I was trying to slide back on my outer clothes from from the wrestling tournament, I couldn't even grip my jacket because my hands were so, well, I don't even know what you call it, but I could not move my fingers. I couldn't because of the intensity of that competition. You realize that that is the illustration that Paul uses of the Christian life. He says the Christian life is a wrestling match. It's a one-on-one competition that's going to take all of your mental, physical, 
energies and you will have to be focused in the midst of that struggle. In Hebrews 12, 1, he says, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He uses the illustration of the race. Now, he's not talking about a sprint. He's not talking about 100 meters. He's not talking about a 5K. He's talking about the marathon. And by the way, what's interesting is when the Apostle Paul uses these athletic illustrations of wrestling and boxing and running, and then he talks about the arena where one is actually fighting hand-to-hand, He's using the illustrations of the sports of their day. He's talking about the football player in the trenches on the line that's struggling the entire game to get to the quarterback or to defend the quarterback. This is the picture that he's using, and he uses the illustration of the distance runner. I've never run more than 10 miles at one time in my life, but when I've come close, it was one of the most miserable things I ever did. Yet this is the illustration that he uses to describe the Christian life, running with patience the race set before us. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertain, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so Paul uses the illustration of the boxer, the wrestler, the runner, and he says, that's what the Christian life is like. And that's why we need relational discipleship. Because the fact is, you need somebody to run the race beside you. You need somebody to train you when you're preparing for the difficulties of life. It's like you need the coach to come alongside and say, keep pushing, you can do this. You need mentors. You need dear friends who are going to come alongside and strengthen and encourage you. And so he says, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Christian life's not easy. By the way, how does God give us his grace? Well, he does it through instruments. He does it through his word. He does it by his spirit. But he does it through people in our lives who come alongside and they walk with us in those greatest of valleys. Through people who share with us God's word at that moment that we needed it most. And so we see the need for relational disciple making. Thirdly, we see the Christian life as a matter of life and death. He uses this phrase. He says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He's using analogies of warfare, of combat. You know, we've lived in a time period where we don't really understand this kind of a thing. But what we need to realize is during the time of Paul, there were Roman soldiers in every single city. There was incredible strength and force that was demonstrated by Rome. They ruled the world. They conquered by force. In fact, one of the things that the peoples of that time period most treasured was whether or not they could demonstrate their physical strength in the arena. And so Paul uses these analogies. But he says it's a matter of life and death. There's a lot on the line when we live the Christian life. In Ephesians 6, 10 to 11, he says, My brethren, be strong in the the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, again, he uses the analogy of the soldier. He talks about the focus of the soldier, the obedience, the submission of the soldier, He talks about the sacrifice of the soldier. He emphasizes the fact that everything's on the line when one is in the position of a soldier under authority. This is why we need discipleship. Because the reality is the Christian experience is tough. Fourthly, there are specific expectations regarding how we live the Christian life. 
He uses this phrase, not crowned, except he strive lawfully. To put it very simply, there are rules and expectations that God has for his people. Just like one enters into competition, if they violate the rules, they're disqualified. Unless it's a baseball player in the 90s, okay? <laughs> you know, the steroid era when all the players were crushing the ball out of the park. It seemed like everybody got away with it. But here's the reality. You violate the rules, even if you're a Lance Armstrong, even if you're a Justin Gatlin, even if you're a Roger Clemens, even if you're an Alex Rodriguez. We could go on a list of athletes who violated the rules and were disqualified. They lost certain honors that they had received. He says in the Christian life, if you don't run your race the way that God says to run it, there's disqualification from certain blessings and prizes that God wants to give to his children who've been faithful. We must all live the Christian life with an awareness of Christ's lordship. We must all live the Christian life with a principled approach to what we do and why we do it. It matters to God. It's true we stand in this position by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, in the righteousness of Jesus alone. We do not deserve our position in any way. But the same fact that we stand in our position by grace doesn't mean there aren't expectations of the way we walk past that time. And the reality is that Paul tells Timothy you need to be a part of intensive discipleship and mentoring because people need to know that. And they need to see that and they need to walk alongside you in this, this struggle. Lastly, we see that we reap according to what we sow. And he says, the husbandman laboreth. And the idea is that we need to be reminded that as we labor in ministry and as we labor with people and as we plant seeds over years and years of life, we may not realize the end result, but someone who's walked in those shoes before can say, keep sowing well now. Here's the result in my life. Here's what happens when you do it the right way. We need that. We then come to a second truth. And the second truth is that the scriptures give us a model for relational disciple making. And in this passage, he actually gives us this model. It's very simple. He says it in verse 2 this way. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now we read the New Testament, we see what we are commanded to do. Matthew 28, it says <coughs> that we are to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's the big picture command. We are to be involved in the Great Commission. But what we've seen and what we've talked about in past sessions is that the Great Commission is not just an individual commission, but individuals play a part in the corporate commission given to the local church. Anybody in here baptizing people? Okay. The answer is no. The church is the one that baptizes those that identify with Christ. But each of us plays a role in that. We know what we're supposed to do. What's interesting is the text in front of us tells us how we're supposed to do it. In other words, the what is go and make disciples. The how is 2 Timothy 2, verse number 2. The things you've heard of me commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And it's a very simple formula or a very simple approach to how we're supposed to do the Great Commission. The first word is learn. He says, the things you have heard of me. In other words, be a learner. Every time these doors are open and you have an opportunity to be in the Lord's house, you should do it. You say, why? Do I really need that much Bible in my life? Yes, you do. You do need it. I need it. Every one of us needs it. The reality is every time we enter these doors, if I'm doing my job the way I'm supposed to, you're being fed. You're learning something. You're growing. You're being challenged. And the reality is that we need that all the time. We need this constant flow of information so that we are digesting the things that we're hearing. 
One of the reasons that Paul loved Timothy so much is because he knew for a fact Timothy was a learner. I'm going to just say this very simply. I will invest in those that are available. That is the way that I operate as a pastor. That's the way that missionaries operate. You have lots and lots of people that you give opportunity to, but only those who take it seriously and say, I'm going to be here and I'm going to learn. You invest in those people. You say, well, why don't you invest in the ones that are not interested? Because it's a waste of time. I'm serious, it really is. You invest in those that want to learn. You invest in those that listen. You invest in those that take it to heart. When Paul says, I have sent Timothy to work with you, he says, there is no one like-minded like Timothy. I know he will care for your affairs the same way that I will. Why did Timothy have that kind of confidence before Paul? Because Paul knew his heart. He said, that man's a learner. That man is an absorber of truth. If he asks me to do something, I do it. If I do it, I do it the way that he'd want me to do it. I do it conscientiously. I do it with a heart and with a passion. And I want to ask you a question. Are you a learner? Are you really committed to being in the position to learn? Someone might say, I'm 60 years old, man. I've sat in church a long time. I've sat in church longer than you've been alive. What are you going to teach me? Well, if that's your attitude, then that's, that's okay. That's the way it is. But the reality is you won't grow. You just won't grow. You might say, well, I've been a Christian for five years. I grew up in a Christian home. I went to Christian college. What do I have to learn? You won't grow. The fact is it's not just about learning new things, but it's about being challenged. It's about being exhorted. It's about our heart being stirred up. There are times that when we read, we read for our minds. And there are times that when we read, we read for our souls. We read to have our hearts stirred up and challenged. Not just filling our heads with information, but our hearts are being stirred up with affections by the things we're being reminded of. We've got to be learners. He says, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses... Lots of people heard Paul's teaching, but Timothy was the one who was always there. It's kind of like Mary and Martha. Mary was the one at Jesus' feet. Martha was the one doing all kinds of things. And the reality is, which of those two was the one who really was close to Christ? It was actually Mary. We see a second statement. The second statement is we need to be not just a learner, but a teacher, The truth is God doesn't want us to just absorb all of this information and just sit on it, but he wants us to absorb it and then he wants it to flow out of us so that we're actually teaching people and we're actually coming alongside and helping them. Notice what he says. (coughs) He says, commit it to faithful men. By the way, when Paul's talking to Timothy, he's saying, Timothy, the people that are most faithful are the ones that should get the most attention. And by the way, in most churches, that's probably not really the way it is. We're constantly trying to get people, why aren't you in church? I'm going to come and get you. I'm going to come and get you. If you're not going to be there, then you're not going to be there. The people that are here are the ones that are to be invested in. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, commit these things to faithful men. Relational disciple making involves learning and it involves teaching. And the reality is that those who are wanting to learn, we would be doing them an incredible disservice by not teaching them, by not giving them the things that they need to be strong and to grow and to mature. But then there's a third, and this is extremely important. And the word is multiplication. He says, who shall be able to teach others also? That's a really amazing thing to think about. No matter who you are, You not only are replaceable, but you will be replaced. And I say you, I mean me too, okay? In fact, the reason that we have a church functioning in Ghana today, I believe this very strongly, is because Micah and I, when we went to Ghana, from the very first day that we started working with people, we invested in them in a way that said, we are going to pass a baton to you. 
when we came to making decisions, we wouldn't just say, here's what we're going to do, but we would say, let's work through this and let's ask some questions together. And as time went on, there came a point in my ministry in Ghana where I realized I'm no longer helping the church thrive, I'm holding the church back. I don't mean I was holding the church back because I was a horrible missionary. What I mean by that is I was holding the church back because I was doing for them what they could do for themselves. In other words, I was teaching classes that they could teach. I was preaching in the pulpit when there were men sitting in that church building that could come up and preach to them just like I was. They had the giftedness to do it. They had the heart to do it. They had the compassion for the people of the church. And by my presence being there, it was keeping them from doing what they were supposed to do. There were counseling sessions I was having with people, and I realized, I don't even need to be in this counseling situation. This person is fully capable of saying the exact same thing that I'm saying here. And all of a sudden, it went from me recognizing I'm the teacher to I'm going to step back and let them teach. And here is the fact. If our churches do not get to the place where we see learning, teaching, and multiplication, our churches will all die. They will not continue. One generation comes and another generation goes. The reality is when I look out over this church, I realize 10 years ago, I was younger than Chris and Paige were when I came here. Do you realize that? And I'm starting to get a little bit of gray, not too much, I'll get a little bit of gray hair here. Get just a little bit. And you know, there's going to be a day that I'm going to be looking at people that were kids in the youth group who are now my age and who have their kids. And I start realizing that, you know, that's the future of the church right there, coming up through the church. This was a teenager, college student, married, having children, all of a sudden we realize that as time goes on, one generation is going and another generation is coming. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, learn when you're in that season. Teach as you are being invested in and get to the place where the people following you have the maturity and the depth and the wisdom and the character to do what you're doing and maybe even better than you're doing it. The reality is that a missionary will not be as effective as a national pastor who is walking with the Lord. He will not. He doesn't speak the same way. He doesn't look the same way. He can know a lot about the culture, but he will always, always, always be a foreigner. You can love people, but you cannot fully remove the stigmatization of being a foreigner in that country. You cannot do it. And the reality is, What we know needs to happen on the mission field has to happen in the church here too. It's just as vital here as it is over there. The reality is we need to see one generation pass the baton to the next generation. And it's not that the generation is no longer important to the church when they pass the baton. They are still extremely important to that church. But what's really important is that they pass it on well. And the next group coming gives vitality and strength to the church, and God uses them in a mighty way. That's the sense of the text in front of us. Paul is passing the baton. He's saying, Timothy, it's your turn, and I trust you, and I, and I know that you're a godly man, and you're going to do a great job, and I want to encourage you. That is the model of Scripture. But there's a third truth that I think is so important, and I want to mention it briefly. <coughs> we must see every context as a potential divine appointment for ministry. I want to say that again. We must see every context as a potential divine appointment for ministry. I know as I look out over this congregation, there are only a few who God will call out and send you to another location and you'll be involved in a church plant. I don't even know if there's anyone in the congregation right now that will do that. There may be, there may not. I don't know. But if there are, it's going to be a very small group of people. How many of those individuals will go to another culture and plant a church as a missionary? A very small group of people. And someone might say, well, you know, then why does this message matter to me? I'm not going to be a church planter. 
I'm not going to be a missionary. It's not that I'm not willing to do that, but God hasn't put that in my heart. He hasn't gifted me that way. He hasn't wired me that way. So how does this apply to me? And I want you to realize something. Where you are today is a divine appointment. I want to give you an example of this. One of the most amazing examples that I can think of in the New Testament, and that is the example we find in Acts 18. (coughs) In Acts chapter 18, this is what the Scripture tells us. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. He came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for, by their occupation, they were tent makers. In Acts chapter 18, we are we are introduced to a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. What's really interesting is as you follow this couple throughout the New Testament, you'll find their names come up in several portions of Scripture. And I want you to realize that Aquila and Priscilla are examples laid out in the Scripture, preserved for us to read about, of people who were divine appointments that God put Paul in their lives and them in Paul's life, through very interesting circumstances, and he used them mightily. Let me put it like this. Aquila and Priscilla were refugees. They were not born in Rome. They moved to Rome. They were not from Rome, and they were not really, Corinth wasn't their home either. How did they end up in Corinth? Well, they were kicked out of Rome. In other words, they were refugees or migrant workers in Corinth who'd been deported from Rome because of an anti-Jewish sentiment in the city. Literally, when Claudius got into that position, he said, you know what, I don't want any Jewish people in this city. I'm kicking everybody out who claims to be of Jewish ethnicity and of the Jewish faith. He said, I'm kicking them out of the city. At the time, I would assume Aquila and Priscilla were not Christians. They didn't know the gospel. The reason that they were kicked out was because they associated with Judaism, not with Christianity or not with some Roman cult. They associated with the Jewish faith. And so here they are, they're migrants. They've been kicked out. And you can only imagine how humiliating that would be, how infuriating that would be. You would say, why in the world did God allow them to be in such a situation? Well, here's what's interesting. Paul and this couple became friends (coughs) at Corinth because they had a similar skill. It wasn't a skill they went to college for. It wasn't a skill they went to trade school for. It was called they worked with their hands, they made tents. (laughs) And you say, well, why were they making tents in Corinth? It's because every year Corinth would have a special games, kind of like the Olympic games. They called them the Isthmian games. And they would have running competitions and weightlifting competitions and wrestling competitions and boxing competitions and gladiator fights and all kinds of things that they did at those Isthmian games. And the reason that they went there is because many people would flock to Corinth at that time of the year and they needed a place to stay. And so they made tents so they could sell them to all these people flocking to Corinth to participate and to watch the games. So you have a migrant family who's been kicked out of Rome and you have the Apostle Paul who travels all over the Roman world establishing churches and they become friends because they're trying to make a living. Sounds like somebody you might work with at a mechanic shop or in your occupation or somebody that you might come in contact with in school. The reality is you're at a similar stage of life, similar interests, similar occupation. You become friends. That's what happened here. But what we see is that Paul's interaction with this couple was something that was clearly an example of relational discipleship. When Paul left Corinth, we see that he traveled with Aquila and Priscilla to Ephesus. (coughs) After he was in Ephesus for a very short period of time, he left them in Ephesus, and what we'll see as we read the book of Acts is that Aquila and Priscilla had an integral ministry in Ephesus without Paul there And so at some point between getting kicked out of Rome, ending up in Corinth, they got to the place where they can articulate the gospel with clarity. They're involved in making disciples. They're involved in a church plant at Ephesus. How did they get there? 
Was it because they went to Bible college? Was it because they took a course in theology? No, it's because of relational discipleship. That's what they did. They learned, he taught, he passed the baton. That's really what happened. During this time, we see that they were able to have a conversation with a man named Apollos. And they sit Apollos down. And Apollos is a very eloquent individual. He is theologically in de- adept. De- but he did not know the full gospel. And so as he's preaching, they pull him aside and they say, Apollos, there's a story you don't know yet, and it's about Jesus and what he did for you. And as they explain the gospel to Apollos, he embraces it. And Apollos becomes a very well-known and articulate evangelist in those areas. <coughs> what is that? That is the result of relational disciple-making. We let her see evidence of this couple in Rome, in Rome, Romans 16, they go back to Rome. In Corinth again, in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, we see them in Ephesus again in 2 Timothy 4, 19. Paul writes, and he addresses those families and those places in his absence. And in all of those examples, it appears that they're involved with a church plant out of their own house. You say, why do you bring this up? I bring this up to say, It's not just missionaries that need to be involved in relational disciple-making. It's not just people going to a foreign field and passing out gospel tracts that are supposed to be involved in relational disciple-making. You and your job are in a unique position that nobody else in this congregation is in. You come in contact with people that nobody else comes in contact with. There is a culture that God planted you in and he wants you to be salt and light and he wants you to be a gospel witness in that particular environment he's placed you in. And that's what Paul was. In fact, some of the most effective gospel ministers are not the one who preaches every Sunday. It's the people sitting in the pews who are talking to their friends and neighbors and co-workers, inviting them to church, inviting them into their homes, talking to them about the gospel, answering their questions, praying for them, weeping with them, encouraging them. That's really where gospel ministry takes place. That's where the vitality of the church is found. And so what we see is that a lifelong fruitful ministry partnership began with a temporary job connected to an annual athletic competition. It'd be like you met somebody selling stuff at the Super Bowl, (laughs) okay? if you want to use that analogy. It's how you became friends. That's how you got to know one another. This is how Paul connects with them. God's providence directed these people together through highly unusual and, may I even add, difficult means. Getting kicked out of a place where you were established because of your race, because of your religion, is not nice. Yet that's what happened. And God used it. He drew good out of what was very bad so that they came in contact with the gospel and eventually were used of the Lord. We learn from this interaction not to underestimate the potential of every divine appointment. And I want to ask you this morning, is it possible that you underestimate your opportunities? That's just a question I want to pose to you. If you were to open your mouth and say, hey, Would you like to come to church with me? Would your witness be compromised? Have you ever felt compelled to speak with the people around you? Would they know to come to you when they're in a crisis because they have confidence in your stability and in your character? That's how we reach people, folks. God wants our church to have a culture that is distinguished by relational disciple-making. That's what he wants for us. That's what the text tells us. And my prayer is that God would help us to see that developed in this church, even beyond where it is today. That we would each play that role that God has fitted us for and that we would be salt and light in the place he has planted us so that he can reach people for his honor and glory. Let's bow together for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you use us in spite of us. We're so grateful that you plant us where you plant us. 
that you empower us to be able to do the work of ministry. I pray that you'd help us as a congregation to be a disciple-making congregation, that this would be a part of the culture of our church, that we would be a warm and friendly and loving community when people walk in, they see a vibrancy and a love for Christ. They see that there's learning and there's investing and there's multiplying. They see that one generation is truly investing in the generation that's following them and that they are thrilled by the way that you use one generation after the other. I pray that you'd help us to take to heart, deeply take to heart, the text that's before us this morning. We ask that you would be glorified through our obedience to the word. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to ask you if you could, uh, our closing hymn that we're going to be 